thanks everyone for uh, being awake at what is, I guess, the penultimate talk uh, of this conference. So, about a week ago in California, I gave a talk on this current uh, philosophical project of mine to a small handful of you. Uh, in that talk, I focused on some of the broader programmatic aspects of the project. So, uh, broadly explicating how current theory is, in principle, leveraged in the uh, process of theoretical research. Since this is a conference explicitly about cosmology and quantum gravity, uh, I'm going to take the opportunity today to focus more directly on uh, the core scientific content of that project. But I see the relationship uh, between the two as something almost like metonymy. Uh, so if you find what I have to say today about uh, dark sector physics interesting or even uh, maybe comforting, making some sense of either what's uh, supposed to be going on in this uh, pocket of speculative uh, cutting-edge physics research, or maybe how we should think about what is going on, then I think you should be particularly predisposed to find my uh, broader project compelling. If you don't, I will try not to have my feelings hurt. <laughs> uh, so this is going to be my claim for today. Dark energy and cold dark matter play profoundly different roles in lambda CDM as pertains to dark sector research. So now, obviously, dark energy and cold dark matter are different things from one another. Uh, the point I intend to make is that the difference between them properly construed really matters in how we uh, think about the fundamental physics research, and in particular the dark sector research that's conducted in each of their names. So lambda CDM is, of course, our current successful theory of large-scale cosmology. Um, I'm going to be careful, though, when I refer to lambda CDM as a successful theory of large-scale cosmology. I mean its successes as pertain to the largest scales in our observable universe, uh, which is to say as a theory of large-scale structure in our universe. In other words, I take the theory to be that which describes the expansionary history of our approximately uniform spatial universe over cosmic time, when our universe is assessed as suitably large scales, in which characteristic large-scale structures uh, formed and evolved amidst those background evolutionary dynamics. I have in mind here an understanding of the theory lambda CDM in terms of that which is constrained uh, by primarily the CMB, including lensing data extracted from it, uh, and perhaps to a lesser extent by supernova searches and the detection of BAOs in both the CMB and in large-scale galaxy surveys. What I'm trying to do here from the start, and I hope I've done a somewhat adequate job of it so far, is to separate the empirically successful theory of large-scale structure, or large-scale cosmology, from the role that such a theory subsequently gets to play in virtue of those empirical successes. Uh, in affecting theoretical research in other domains of physics. So in particular, I have in mind those domains in physics whose target phenomena reside in our universe, might be all domains of physics in some sense, when our universe is assessed at smaller scales, and even fundamental scales. And so it's that last case, uh, as is probably clear by now, that interests me most today. Lambda CDM is regularly leveraged in the pursuit of new fundamental theory in physics. Uh, as a description of this conference attests to, this relationship is usually thought about in the context of early universe cosmology, where our access to traces from our deep past are treated by means of leveraging the cosmological theory as roughly analogous to the data we get from ever more ambitious slider experiments, so the poor man's particle accelerator case. It isn't quite that simple, of course, but in any case, that isn't what I'm focusing on today. Uh, instead, I'm interested in what is generally called dark sector research. Nominally, dark sector research is concerned with possible extensions to the standard model of particle physics plus gravity, uh, or more generally, revisions to our current fundamental understanding of what constitutes our universe. So, WIMPs, as we heard, fifth forces, chameleons, quintessence, and the like. 
And the reasons for those speculations are ostensibly owed to, or at the very least are strongly influenced by, the roles played by dark energy and cold dark matter within lambda CDM. Ostensibly, the presence of dark energy and cold dark matter, so lambda and CDM, respectively, in our large-scale universe, where our large-scale universe is again understood according to the theory lambda CDM, are each taken to motivate the need for some such revision to our current fundamental understanding of what ultimately constitutes our universe. So, whereas the early universe is via leveraging lambda CDM, seen as an environment to study new fundamental physics, which is to say as a tool for pursuing new research in the fundamental domain, the cosmic dark ages and onward, uh, that is where cold dark matter and then dark energy essentially dominate, are seen more or less as providing theoretical physicists with phenomena in our universe to be accounted for within our fundamental physics. Now, I don't mean to uh, make too much of a switchover uh, between the two epochs within our cosmic history. My point, I think, is actually stronger if I neglect, if I neglect that there is a switchover in practice. Uh, so dark, dark sector physics simply captures a different way of leveraging lambda CDM in the service of fundamental physics research. Uh, than the way it's typically considered to be leveraged. And I actually uh, suspect some inflationary cosmology research, as well as some of the, um, at least some of the work in primordial black holes as cold dark matter, um, blurs between these two ways of leveraging the early universe, uh, or the early large scale universe. Uh, but that's something I need to think about more and is outside the confines of the talk. In any case, within that latter context, I'm going to argue that dark energy and cold dark matter play profoundly different roles in lambda CDM, such that dark energy ought to enjoy a special kind of status within dark sector research in comparison. <clears throat> My main antagonist, by the way, is the view that dark energy and cold dark matter are contrary to what I just said, both merely discrepancies in our bookkeeping uh, of what there is in our universe as, as assessed across all scales. So in order to make these sorts of claims, I'll have to be very careful delineating what I take to be the theory lambda CDM, properly construed, separate from its use in ongoing theoretical research. This is where I will begin, developing and arguing for an interpretation of lambda CDM regarded as our theory of large-scale structure, according to which we should feel entitled to offer pronouncements of the kind I've just suggested. My standard or criteria uh, for such an interpretation is that it accords with cosmological practice. As being in accordance with practice ensures that the interpretation captures whatever it is about the theory that can account for its empirical successes. This criterion will lead me to favor what I call scale-sensitive uh, interpretations of large-scale cosmological theories over scale-free interpretations of the same, which is a distinction I'll try to clarify by drawing on the history uh, surrounding steady-state theory, which was an early competitor to what has since become lambda CDM. Having clarified that distinction, hopefully, and having argued in favor of scale-sensitive interpretations of large-scale cosmological theories, the second stage of my argument is going to consist in my introducing one instance of such a scale-sensitive interpretation of lambda CDM in particular, on assumption that it's an appropriate interpretation, that is, the sort of interpretation according to which we may feel entitled to wield the theory in virtue of its successes in our ongoing fundamental physics research. This interpretation of lambda CDM is therefore going to be what can ground my assessments of dark energy and cold dark matter as pertains to dark sector research. In other words, I'll finally be in the position to pass my intended judgments about dark energy and cold dark matter based on how the two quantities are respectively understood according to the particular interpretation of lambda CDM on behalf of which I will have just effectively lobbied. I'll take each in turn Unlike what would seem to follow from a scale-free interpretation of lambda CDM, 
Dark energy and cold dark matter play essentially different roles in the theory, according to this particular scale-sensitive interpretation. Such that, upon our embrace of the interpretation, dark energy ought to enjoy, again, a special status within dark sector research. So here we go. It's tempting to regard Lambda CDM as an application of our current understanding of fundamental physics to our universe as a whole, when all but the largest scale effects of that fundamental physics are conveniently ignored. This is the view one finds, for instance, in the opening discussion of Hawking and Ellis' uh, well-known treatise on the large-scale structure of space-time, whose first chapter is tellingly, I think, titled, The Role of Gravity. In a moment, I would like to call this a particular instance of a scale-free interpretation of Lambda CDM. Because the intended scale at which the theory is taken to be physically relevant plays no obvious role in assigning physical content to the theory. In this particular case, the only role for scale is evidently in sorting and distinguishing uh, That screen just cut off, but that one didn't, so we're good. Um, so the only role for scale in the sort of Hawking and Ellis style picture is in sorting and distinguishing which fundamental physics is supposed to be most relevant to constructing the applied theory in the first place. So again, gravity in, strong nuclear out, etc. It's according to this scale-free interpretation uh, of Lambda CDM, I believe, that dark sector research is ordinarily or most often motivated, whereby dark energy and cold dark matter are each regarded as imprints of incredibly subtle fundamental physics, each of which only happens to be easily detected in the application of a corresponding fundamental theory to the largest scales. So I've said that uh, this view of Lambda CDM is tempting. Unfortunately, I think it's also ultimately flawed. Despite its consonance with our current picture of fundamental physics, the view fails to accord, I think, with cosmological practice. And it's only via an, an interpretation in accordance with cosmological practice that the physical content of the theory necessarily corresponds to the empirical record that the theory claims to so successfully capture and on the basis of which we then feel comfortable today licensing very particular sorts of claims, <coughs> namely about our large-scale observable universe. And the view of Lambda CDM that I just sketched simply doesn't do this. At the very least, cosmological practice doesn't require that large-scale structure constitute a sector of our fundamental theory of gravity, or whatever combination of fundamental physics we think dominates at large scales. This is illustrated by the common use of thermodynamic techniques uh, throughout the history of the discipline of cosmology, as well as by other currently popular phenomenological approaches to modeling evolutionary dynamics at large scales. Uh, for instance, uh, via some FR theories in the presence of appropriate global structures. Speaking more generally, I think the history of cosmological practice seems to en endorse an attitude very nearly the opposite that theories of large-scale cosmology, including but not limited to Lambda CDM, be interpreted in what I have chosen to call a scale-sensitive manner, where the intended scale of the application of a successful theory plays a direct, overt role in cosmologists' reckoning about what the theory tells us about the world, in virtue of that theory being successful. So turning to one particular episode within the history of cosmology, will help me, hopefully, illustrate this distinction between scale-sensitive interpretations and scale-free interpretations. Again, of large-scale cosmological theories, generally. Uh, and it will let me do this in a way that doesn't confuse any issues that are specific to the case of Lambda CDM, which is uh, usually our default uh, go-to when we think cosmology. So, as I already mentioned, I have in mind here the history of steady-state theory prior to the 1960s an alternative large-scale cosmological theory to what came to be Lambda CDM. Discussing the details of steady-state theory, uh, as well as the surrounding context in large-scale cosmology at the time, will put me in the position to show why it is that, generally, we might expect interpretations of large-scale cosmological theories that accord with cosmological practice to be scale-sensitive. 
So in the wake of observational work by Hubble, uh, it had become clear, at least by the mid-1940s, module of some more to interrupt the timeline, uh, that the space-time geometry of a certain class of Big Bang models of general relativity was well-suited to capture Hubble's observations in terms of an expansion of the nearby spatial universe over cosmic times, at least at supergalactic distance scales. But this class of models was, as we all know, generally characterized by an initial singularity or a beginning of cosmic time, so a Big Bang, which postdated the presumed Earths of the oldest observed stars and galaxies, and also perhaps Earth, depending on when we're talking about. Uh, again, as, as those latter physics were understood at the time according to various non-gravitational this situation is sometimes referred to as the time scale problem in, within Big Bang cosmology. So at the most recent uh, Philosophy of Science Association meeting, uh, Siska drew my attention to the fact that in any analysis of cosmological practice pertaining to the development of Big Bang cosmology, uh, or what came to be Lambda CDN, it seems to be pertinent that the time scale problem was, at least in the beginning, not necessarily regarded as straightforward grounds for an argument to discard the relevance of the theory at the largest scales. In other words, this wasn't a situation, or it need not, or wasn't viewed by all as a situation in cosmological practice where our universe was regarded as too young to house its oldest stars. But rather, it could be a situation where friction between claims about physics made at different scales served as motivations for revisions in each of the relevant theories intended for those different scales. The flexibility inherent in this attitude is then what seemed to allow cosmologists to continue working on the theory to great success over the next few pivotal decades. In any case, one of, during that time, one of the advertised virtues of steady state theory, which emerged at the end of the 1940s, was that it altogether avoided the time scale problem. In an old article on the subject, uh, Yuri Balashov argues, convincingly in my opinion, that in an attentive historical assessment of this period in cosmological practice, steady state theory is best regarded as consisting of two nearly entirely distinct versions, featuring radically different interpretations. Nonetheless, both versions were regarded as having to reckon with the following uh, two facts. In steady state theory, the foliation of the space-time into space over cosmic time has to be put in by hand, and gravitational, or rather general relativistic, energy conservation is everywhere locally violated, given ordinary assumptions about matter. Tracking those different reckonings will be extraordinarily helpful for my purposes. So in SST1, following Galashov's naming convention, an overarching commitment to steady state, to the steady state account, merited a search for a revised understanding of the fundamental physics of gravity. So the idea here is that one constraint on the construction of such a new theory of gravity is that steady state theory thought to be an application of that new fundamental theory to our large scale universe would necessarily constitute a sector there. So in this way, gravitational energy conservation uh, would be satisfied in steady state theory for precisely the reason that it fails to satisfy general relativistic energy conservation. <coughs> and the preferred foliation of the space time would be built into the fundamental physics of gravity. This might be hinting at something like a, what we would now call a tensor vector theory, but the details are ambiguous. I should like to identify SST1 as a scale-free interpretation of steady-state theory, because it interprets the theory as the direct result of applying some or other understanding of some physics, developed at one scale, to some empirical setting which just so happens to be characterized as another. In the present case, we regard the cosmological theory as an application of our fundamental theory of physics to a setting in which, according to that fundamental theory, gravity dominates. Consequently, it suffices to model the large-scale setting gravitationally, and so commitments within the context of the cosmological theory, in light of our empirical record and our background philosophical beliefs, in the case of SST1, uh, 
those commitments entail further commitments within the context of our fundamental theory of gravity in virtue of the application of that theory to the large-scale system. So in the event of a discrepancy between the fundamental theory and its application, those commitments constituted reasons to revise the fundamental theory. Meanwhile, in SST2, an analogous commitment to the steady state model at large scales, in conjunction with a commitment to a general relativistic notion of energy conservation, merited an inference toward new physics that arises exclusively at large scales in our universe. In particular, one identifies what came to be called the C field, what we might today regard as an effective Lorentz violating quantity uh, in the large scale theory, which was ultimately supposed to reduce to new, highly non-classical, high-energy nuclear physics in the centers of stars and galaxies. <coughs> Together with ordinary matter, though, the C field ensured general relativistic energy conservation at the largest scales, uh, locally, of course, while simultaneously explaining the preferred foliation in the large-scale theory as ultimately due to interesting new physics confined to the internal character of a particular privileged family of world lines whose average behavior was supposed to coincide with the effective physics of the C-field. So in contrast with SST1, SST2 seems to be, to me, very obviously, a scale-sensitive interpretation of steady-state theory. The inference to an effective quantity, the C-field, depends on interpreting steady-state theory as a theory which is intended for deployment at large scales within our universe. So within a universe that is otherwise governed by a variety of more fundamental physics at scales much smaller. According to SST2, the commitment to steady state theory at large scales requires an explanation of the C field as a quantity that emerges uh, at suitably large scales in virtue of facts about uh, the universe at smaller scales. To the extent that all known non-gravitational fundamental physics was thought to be sequestered at large scales, it follows that the emergence of the C-field must be attributed to uh, some new fundamental physics that only fails to be sequestered in very particular circumstances. For instance, in stellar and AGN processes, uh, which, as I said, could be rendered in the large-scale theory as coinciding with the C-field. Now, as Balashov points out, SST2 led to a viable program of research that persisted long after the historical episode that he focuses on and that I've essentially discussed. Whereas SST1 was very quickly abandoned prior to the now famous observations of the cosmic microwave background. Uh, and I sort of alluded to this already, but Balashov points out the corresponding search for an alternative gravity theory motivated in the SST1 uh, setup was, uh, it was abandoned very quickly as and this is a quote from Balashov, too obscure and highly ambiguous a problem uh, to be worth tackling. In other words, at least in the case of cosmological practice pertaining to steady state theory, uh, the scale-free interpretation was unwieldy, we might say, while the scale-sensitive interpretation presented a mm -hmm. viable basis to develop a larger programming mm -hmm. research responsive to new em empirical <coughs> investigations in the discipline. So I take this to be suggestive, only suggestive, that there are significant methodological advances, or advantages, excuse me, of scale-sensitive interpretations of cosmological theories in practice, which could be weak evidence for the claim that, given the impressive empirical successes of Lambda CDM, the production of the theory ought to be regarded as a consequence of cosmological practice supporting a scale-sensitive interpretation of the corresponding theory. Lest that impressive empirical success be seen perpetually as accidental or coincidental. In time, steady state theory on both interpretations fell out of favor compared to Big Bang cosmology. I will assert that it is a dead theory. Uh, in part, as high energy stellar and galactic astrophysics matured, but primarily due to the observations of the cosmic microwave background. As Balashov stresses, what eroded were foremost, uh, what I've left essentially unspoken. So those background reasons to commit on the largest scales to the spatiotemporal structure that was relevant to steady state theory, rather than the structure relevant to Big Bang cosmology. These developments seem to be a part of what ultimately led physicists to 
embrace the plausibility of a past finite spatiotemporal structure for our large scale universe. As a consequence of the successful application of Big Bang cosmology to nearby astronomical data. In light of this development, the frontiers of theoretical cosmology turn in earnest to the very early universe, approaching and in some respects within the Big Bang method. And so came to be born the more standard role of the early universe as a tool in fundamental physics research, as mentioned at the beginning of the talk. That's some history. The question I should like to turn to now is this. What does a scale-sensitive interpretation of Lambda CDM, as Big Bang cosmology has matured to this day, look like in detail? So Lambda CDM is typically regarded as, at its mathematical foundations, a general relativistic theory. And this is just what has contributed to what I've argued is the wrong impression that Lambda CDM constitutes an application of our general relativistic fundamental theory of gravity. But there's an obvious sense in which our current best theory of our large-scale universe need not have been general relativistic, independent of facts about our current understanding of the fundamental physics of gravity. For instance, in the case of an FR theory appropriate for large scales, uh, like I mentioned in passing before. This makes salient, I think, the question, what are we entitled to infer about the relationship between gravity and our large-scale universe in virtue of the shared mathematical foundations between our current best theories of each. The thought here is that we ought to be able to leverage, in some or other way, in frontier theoretical <laughs> physics research, this point of commonality between our general relativistic theory of gravity and our general relativistic theory of large scale structure, in virtue of our universe at the largest scales, given our best efforts being quite well regarded in terms of the latter, and our best understanding of fundamental physics so far being understood in terms of the former. So for the interest of time, I'm not going to say anything uh, more about the mathematical details of general relativity than what is minimally necessary. Uh, very roughly speaking, we have a theory of a universe in terms of a manifold and a metric defined on that manifold, which encodes everything, we might say, spatiotemporal about it. <coughs> everything matter-like about the universe meanwhile, is encoded in the stress energy associated with that spatiotemporal geometry, which is to say in the Einstein lambda tensor constructed out of the metric and its derivatives. The Einstein lambda tensor, in fact, belongs to a family of tensors, the Einstein tensors, indexed canonically by a choice of cosmological constant lambda. So in other words, the stress energy associated with the space-time is entirely determined by facts about the spatiotemporal geometry of the universe, encoded in the metric G and its derivatives, as well as whatever reasons go into the selection of the cosmological constant lambda, or rather, the corresponding Einstein lambda tensor from the family of Einstein tensors. This is the way of phrasing the theory that downplays the dynamical content of our general relativistic theory of gravity. That's intentional. Setting aside the subtleties that arise with vial curvature, as well as with the quantum nature of matter, Given this brief characterization of general relativity, our current fundamental theory of gravity identifies fundamental spatiotemporal structure with the small scale quasi fundamental distribution of matter throughout a space time. In other words, given a model of the gravitational theory, a space time or manifold and metric defined there, not only is the metric taken to directly encode ultimate facts about space and time locally in that model, it's also taken to indirectly encode ultimate facts about matter there via the Einstein lambda tensor. That is to say, via whatever are the reasons for picking that particular cosmological constant lambda regarding our fundamental theory of gravity. In other words, the metric is constrained by the dynamics of matter in accordance with Einstein's field equation, given some or other fixed cosmological constant that appears in that equation. It's the more standard presentation of the constant theory. One notable consequence of this dual role of the metric is that many physically motivated models of the gravitational theory, where certain ordinary facts about matter uh, and a cosmological constant are stipulated, uh, these models can fail to possess spatiotemporal structure that is uh, necessary to recover an adequate notion of cosmic time, or else fail to possess spatiotemporal structure that is, in some sense, sufficiently homogenized so that recorded observations today of points in space at a moment in cosmic time 
may be rendered as representative of observations one might have made today of space at that time, more generally. So in other words, what these physically plausible models highlight is that some models of the fundamental physics of gravity apparently lack the right sort of properties to articulate the core content of a satisfying theory of large-scale cosmology. At least for us observers, schematized as world lines within it, were our universe to be so structured. On the other hand, restricting attention to spatiotemporal structure compatible with lambda CDM ensures that those properties are satisfied. Space-time can be considered as a spatial expanse evolving over cosmic time, where moreover, that spatial expanse can be chosen so as to render here now typical of any point now, and likewise there then typical of then. So in order to make sense of the well-behavedness of the large-scale spatiotemporal structure inherent in lambda CDM, compared to what it might have been otherwise, general relativistically speaking, it seems prudent that we regard that well-behavedness as a stipulation or a working hypothesis about some particular effective physics that's present in our universe, when the latter, our universe, is considered at the largest scale. What we might call effective spatiotemporal structure. It follows that the theory governing this effective spatiotemporal structure is understood as that which we take to be relevant as a theory intended for suitably large scales in a universe which we otherwise have plenty of good reasons to believe is governed by more fundamental physics, as we've come to think about such matters in other contexts. As such, understanding lambda CDM as a theory first and foremost about effective spatiotemporal structure is all ready to interpret the theory in a scale-sensitive fashion. <coughs> the job now is going to be to provide a consistent follow-through, which is, on the whole, a plausibly appropriate interpretation of lambda CDM given how we typically think about the successes of contemporary large-scale cosmology. Note also that on this view of lambda CDM as foremost about effective spatiotemporal structure, one may rightly ask, how does that effective spatiotemporal structure, governed by the theory intended for large scales in our universe, indeed emerge at those large scales so as to be governed by such a theory, given what we think we know about physics in our universe at scales much smaller? This question is then pressing in theoretical research exactly to the extent that the working hypothesis stated before proves fruitful. Or in other words, to the extent that we believe lambda CDM, understood as a theory foremost about effective space controls geometry, can be deployed as an empirically successful theory of large-scale cosmology. I take this to be somewhat similar to the point that I attributed uh, to Siska earlier about the productive role of the timescale problem in the development of Big Bang cosmology. In any case, taking such a belief for granted so that the research question just offered is indeed pressing, we can return to our initial motivating question about the relationship between gravity and our large-scale universe and new light. To the extent that our current best treatments of each subject share mathematical foundations, we may subject the physics of each to direct comparison. Gravity, in virtue of being understood in general relativistic terms, identifies fundamental spatiotemporal structure in our universe with the distribution of matter there. Given certain assumptions about the average character of the matter that's present in our universe, uh, formed at least putatively on the basis of our observations and inductive schemas that are sufficiently ambitious, we may build up a picture of average spatiotemporal structure at sufficiently large scales that we further constrain on the basis of astronomical data. To borrow at risk of abusing a phrase from practice, we might wish to name this a concordance model of our fundamental theory of gravity, suitably coarse grain, with respect to our astronomical record. Meanwhile, lambda CDM, in virtue of being understood in general relativistic terms, identifies the working hypothesis stated above about effective spatiotemporal structure within a theory intended for the largest scales in our universe, with an equivalent formulation in terms of an effective distribution of something matter-like in such a theory, or what we might call cosmological grade matter. Broad assumptions about the behavior of such cosmological grade matter thereby serve as reasons in the large-scale theory for picking a particular Einstein lambda tensor from the family of Einstein tensors. Consequent to the empirical successes of lambda CDM, this begets the pressing research question, whence comes cosmological grade matter? 
uh, as defined with respect to that particular choice, the cosmological constant lambda, given a fundamental distribution of matter that, when averaged at the scales that are relevant to lambda CDM, produces the, that average concordance model I just mentioned. Since lambda CDM and gravity share general relativistic foundations, to the extent that the average spatiotemporal structure above may be identified with the effective spatiotemporal structure, so the concordance model of the fundamental physics of gravity may be identified with lambda CDM, the answer is that cosmological grade matter emerges out of the averaging procedures implicitly leveraged in the construction of the concordance model, together with facts about the more fundamental distribution of matter in our universe. As an aside, I'm including as a feature of those averaging procedures the assumption that gravity increasingly dominates all other fundamental physics as we approach large scales, in which case it is, by hypothesis, increasingly warranted in the concordance model that the large-scale theory be compared without complaint uh, to a model built of our fundamental physics of just gravity in isolation of any other fundamental physics. This is all very similar, I would claim, to the situation regarding the C-field in the scale-sensitive interpretation of steady-state theory that I discussed earlier. There, the inference to the C-field is what renders the large-scale theory something comparable to a general relativistic concordance model, at least in terms of local energy conservation. But embracing such an inference came at the cost of meriting, which is to say, the cost of explicitly motivating new and interesting fundamental physics research. As will become clear, something similar goes on, I think, in dark sector research. In any case, this is what the shared foundations of lambda CDM and gravity let us infer about the relationship between our large-scale universe and the fundamental force of gravity as we presently understand each. Effective quantities relevant to the former can, in the right circumstances, be regarded as effects of merely averaging over particular quantities in the latter, in virtue of the latter being expected to dominate at relatively large scales. Now, as just stated, effective spatiotemporal structure is beholden to more fundamental physics whose details could undermine its legitimacy at smaller scales, but whose details nonetheless explain the emergence of that structure at suitably large scales. Uh, in a recent article by Michaela Massini discussing astrophysical cold dark matter versus MOND in galactic astrophysics, uh, she more or less turns this view on its head. I take her argument, and it won't be important here, in stride. My point above is not that every effective quantity at certain large scales is owed smaller scale or even fundamental explanations in virtue of arising in a corresponding theory intended for large scales. Rather, insofar as such a theory is interpreted in a scale-sensitive fashion, its quantities, taken to be autonomous at that scale, need to be systematically linked up to other quantities that emerge as autonomous at all other scales, according to scale-sensitive theories intended for those other scales. So hopefully this all seems, so far, a satisfying interpretation of lambda CDM as it relates to the fundamental physics of gravity. Cosmological grade matter, comparable, at least in principle, with the coarse graining of a more fundamental picture of the distribution of matter in our universe. What of the story of cosmic structure formation? An historically standard criteria of success for a large-scale cosmological theory. If by assumption what's here now is typical of now and what's there then is typical of then, not much can happen over the history of our observable universe understood at the largest scales. In other words, so far we have a physics, effective physics told in terms of one variable large-scale expansion rate. While this already gives us a good deal to work with in theoretical research, it seems that the working hypothesis we adopted before is poised to undermine exactly that for which lambda CDM is most well known and loved. To deal with this, cosmologists proceed by embracing standard technique of physics. They introduce perturbations which are studied by means of a linear perturbation theory associated with general relativity, and that's formulated on the effective space of temporal background uh, already discussed. Those perturbations are then regarded, and this is the crucial point, as physically rich, which is to say as effective physical quantities in themselves that evolve according to those linear dynamics and that are moreover immersed in the background evolutionary dynamics of the large scale theory. So the relevance of those linear dynamics uh, defined on that background carry the status of a second working hypothesis in our theory. Consequent to the empirical successes of lambda CDM pertaining to cosmic structure formation, the question becomes pressing, how do these physically rich perturbations emerge out of smaller scale physics? 
such that the consequences of the smaller scale physics are adequately modeled at the largest scales by a linear perturbation theory about the large scale background already assumed. In sum, at least according to this scale sensitive interpretation, uh, there are two salient autonomous physical quantities in lambda CDM governed by two distinct dynamics. One, physically rich perturbations defined with respect to a large scale background, which evolve linearly. Two, that very background itself as understood as constituting cosmological grade matter. So goes the theory of lambda CDM. I'm now in the position to discuss both dark energy and cold dark matter in lambda CDM, as lambda CDM is understood in terms of the particular scale sensitive interpretation I've just given. The key point from the get go is that to the extent that there are two salient autonomous physical quantities in lambda CDM that are each governed by particular large scale effective physics in our universe, dark energy is going to be understood as an inference concerning one, juxtaposed against fundamental physics, and cold dark matter is an inference concerning the other. And I'll consider each quickly in turn. According to lambda CDM as presented above, cosmological grade matter is determined by effective spatiotemporal structure, as well as broad assumptions about the character of such a resulting quantity, which together ground a particular choice of Einstein lambda tensor. Note, in other words, that cosmological grade matter is not determined by a coarse grain of some more fundamental distribution of matter, but by a commitment to regarding the large scale theory in the first place as a general relativistic theory, in order to subsequently permit comparisons to such coarse grain. So on a standard reading, dark energy is that quantity in lambda CDM whose presence mimics the effects of a cosmological constant greater than zero, a value we label capital M. But this characterization of dark energy raises the question, whence those reasons for our having chosen the Einstein zero tensor in the first place? The answer, it seems to me, is closely related to my discussion about directly comparing the concordance model constructed out of our fundamental physics with the effective spatiotemporal structure in the large scale theory. To the extent that there is a zero cosmological constant in the fundamental uh, theory, coarse graining isn't going to change that, is so the default belief. Uh, and so viewing lambda CDM as merely a concordance model of the fundamental physics of gravity gives good reason to expect a cosmological constant of zero. But again, lambda CDM isn't a concordance model of our fundamental theory of gravity, not as I've understood it here. In lambda CDM, the cosmological constant is set phenomenologically. Given broad assumptions about what the resulting cosmological grade matter should look like. So for this reason, I suggest the following modification to the standard reading of dark energy in lambda CDM just rehearsed. Dark energy is precisely that which we regard as responsible for rendering lambda CDM as a general relativistic theory characterized by cosmological constant capital lambda, as opposed to it being rendered a general relativistic theory characterized by any other valued cosmological constant. What this means is, in the context of fundamental physics research is that dark energy naturally motivates a particular line of research somewhat like the Seafield case. As a criterion for empirical adequacy in the next generation theory, averaging out within the context of our particular universe to scales relevant to lambda CDM gives us cause to introduce a cosmological constant to mediate what is well regarded as a general relativistic gravitational coupling between spatiotemporal geometry and coarse grained matter. That is to say, there's going to have to be some crucial fundamental physics in that future theory, contrary to current fundamental theory, which bears responsibility for the emergence of such a term at the large scales in our universe. This is consistent with the scenario of natural and scale-free interpretation dismissed earlier, where we regard dark energy as a precision <coughs> measurement of a cosmological constant in our fundamental theory of gravity. But it's also ultimately much more flexible. For instance, it supports scenarios where it is only in our universe that upon reaching the relevant large scales and foliating space-time into space over cosmic time, there would be such an effect which otherwise resembles a fundamental cosmological constant. I'm just about out of time, but unlike dark energy, Cold dark matter is typically regarded as providing both causal and explanatory origins for cosmic structures observed throughout the history of our observable universe. On a standard reading of lambda CDM, there's a uniform pressureless dust that contributes to cosmological grade matter. So we might call this dust cosmological grade cold dark matter. 
on the story in homogeneities which are allowed to form within earlier epochs than when similar in homogeneities would be formed in a coarse graining of ordinary matter. Uh, those early in homogeneities are taken to constitute the linearly evolving physically rich perturbations on the affected background discussed above, whose legacies are again intended to capture the evolution of cosmic structures of the largest scales. This identification is motivated very naturally by the observation that for sufficiently small bodies with respect to a fixed scale, the linear contribution in a relativistic perturbation theory about a background adequately approximates the entirely nonlinear gravitational properties of those small bodies. So general relativistic gravitational dynamics at more fundamental scales will be approximately linear with respect to the large scale background at large scales. And so overdense regions of otherwise gravitating dust would naturally give rise to the physically rich, linearly evolving perturbations in lambda CDM. But cosmological grade matter, uh, cold dark matter, excuse me, involves commitments beyond lambda CDM. And this is the main takeaway. Cosmological grade matter in lambda CDM is not constituted by a coarse graining of some more fundamental distribution of matter. The mistake in the common treatment is to assume that cold dark matter, as it's supposed to explain structure formation in lambda CDM, is automatically what I've called cosmological grade cold dark matter, a subspecies of cosmological grade matter which bears systematic relationship to quantities found in other theories developed in other states. In other words, to the extent that we leverage our theories intended for smaller scales as a means to interpret cosmological grade matter in terms of those other theories, Cold dark matter in lambda CDM constrains our fundamental dark center research. That's a big step, though, beyond the confines of the empirically successful theory of large scale cosmology, or large scale structure. And what fundamental physics research is motivated by such a step is subsequently highly sensitive to disputes over what we purport to know about the <coughs> physics of our universe at scales assessed, or at assessed. What we purport to know about the physics of our universe when it's assessed at those various smaller scales. So for instance, if we take sort of the classic view that astrophysical cold dark matter is operating at galactic scales, then cold dark matter in lambda CDM constrains our dark sector research that is, seems to be foremost motivated by astrophysical <coughs> cold dark matter. If a contrarian comes in and says we ought to embrace MOND at galactic scales, then lambda CDM is going to constrain dark sector research along the lines suggested by, among other things, uh, superfluid dark matter. So our search for a particle in dark sector research then becomes the search for a particle that may undergo a superfluid phase transition at extragalactic scales. Or consider as a final case uh, a situation where we see fit to replace general relativity with something like mimetic gravity as our fundamental theory whose non-propagating scalar degree of freedom winds up mimicking cosmological grade cold dark matter explicitly in a way that prohibits lumps from forming and gravitating linearly, or approximately linearly. Then lambda CDM constrains dark sector research primarily motivated by that modified gravity in an entirely different way. Either there's some additional species of cold dark matter or there's some more complicated story to tell about the origins of those physically rich linear perturbations at the largest scale. These examples aren't meant to be exhaustive, but rather to be illustrative of the ultimately derivative way by which cold dark matter, as it shows up in lambda CDM, motivates dark sector research. The point to be made here is that this derivative character is in stark contrast to the situation with respect to dark energy already discussed. So I've argued that on careful consideration of lambda CDM, dark energy has a special role in relation to ongoing fundamental physics research, which cold dark matter lacks. Along the way to establishing these claims, I've committed to the view that our interpretations of large-scale cosmological theories ought to accord with cosmological practice, and in particular that we ought to interpret lambda CDM as a theory about effective spatiotemporal structure, as well as physically rich perturbations which evolve linearly on top. I've not suggested that cold dark matter research should be suppressed, discouraged, or anything of that sort, nor that dark energy is more likely to be true, whatever that's supposed to mean. If anything, my point really there's a very natural sense in which looking at our empirically successful theory of large-scale structure in juxtaposition with our present understanding of fundamental physics. Dark energy is plausibly a key clue about future fundamental physics. 
It gives us motivation to do certain things in our research on the basis of the success of the large-scale theory. Meanwhile, whatever clue cold dark matter provides is mediated by crucial assumptions about its character across scales, which is to say the identification of the relevant quantity in the large-scale cosmological theory with quantities in theories deployed at those other scales. Cutting myself off here, so thank you. Since we started at 11.35, we have about 10 minutes for questions. Mike, could you turn the microphone towards you just a little bit? Thanks. Chris. Uh, so I have uh, a few questions. Um, let me stick with uh, two. So, uh, so, so let me start with the, uh, there's a question that actually arose immediately in the discussion between Einstein and de Sitter, when Einstein first introduced the cosmological constant, and de Sitter pushed him in correspondence to say, what is this lambda term, and how do you think about it? And uh, Einstein's view wasn't entirely clear. He seemed to think of it as uh, perhaps arriving at some sort of average of different types of matter, or maybe real matter is condensed types of uh, this other type of, you know, whatever the cosmic fluid is. Um, you know, they went back and forth a little bit, it wasn't entirely clear, but my impression is that on your view that would be a completely uh, misguided way of talking about cosmological gray matter or dark energy, right? That it, the relationship between ordinary matter and whatever lambda represents can't be that, and so I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. And then the second question is, I just want to have a clearer sense of how a scale-sensitive interpretation differs from the kind of view that I think a cosmologist might have, but, you know, they'd say something like, well, part of cosmology is a theory of certain large-scale degrees of freedom of the gravitational field. We know that there are certain domains in which we can apply linear perturbation theory, and so there's a scale sensitivity in the sense of there's a domain past which once the density contrast grows to a certain extent we now no longer can trust linearized perturbation theory um, and so they're, they're certainly scale sensitive in the way they're understanding the application of their theory but I think the scale sensitive interpretation involves something more than that so if you could those are just two questions partly to clarify how you interpret lambda in the sort of cosmological great sense, and then what you mean by scale sensitivity. Um, good. I suspect my answers are going to be unrelated unless they wind up being related accidentally. So the first question, uh, I think that sort of discussion, on, on my analysis of this situation, shows up after we would have empirical commitments, or at that time, background philosophical commitments, so like a static universe type mm -hmm. desire for overarching reasons. And that once we committed to that and saw fit, in a sense, phenomenologically, to fix lambda, there's a very natural question of what could give rise to it, either in all universes or with respect to our particular universe. Um, so those questions are motivated to the extent, or are perfectly kosher on this view, uh, if we treat Einstein's background philosophical commitments in a manner similar to sort of today's cosmologist phenomenological commitments. Mm -hmm. um, and we saw that a similar situation is going on, at least with COIL and steady state theory too, where the background philosophical commitments are acting as motivation in a very structurally similar way to the way empirical data would be held as motivation. So that's the first one. The second question is about scale sensitive interpretation versus just being aware that you are doing all of your physics in the world and there are scales. Well, the, yeah, there's sort of scale sensitive domain of applicability. Or, yeah. Right. Um, so phrased that latter way, it sounds like there's possible reconciliation right off the bat. Uh, so what I have in mind by scale-sensitive interpretation is that um, 
when we try to understand what we are allowed to claim about our large scale universe or about large scale structures is that they are large scale structures in a universe with other interesting physics going on at smaller scales. Uh, other, in fact, highly nonlinear physics going on at smaller scales, and so it's delightful that the universe is structured in such a way that by the time we've gotten up to those large scales, we apparently can write down a linear theory that is both useful and looks a lot like the relevant mathematics going on in the fundamental theory. And so then, my the big point that I wanted to underscore would be uh, interesting question that I don't think is phrased explicitly often enough is how can we leverage that state of affairs that uh, yeah that it is sufficiently like the smaller scale stuff that we know how to compare across scales, uh, but that it is also as empirically successful about its own large scale. Does that? Yeah, that helps. Community. The uh, first regarding this uh, situation, I should say that Polashov's papers are completely unknown in the, um, in the among practical uh, physicists and as uh, um, uh, physicists. I just uh, uh, um, in into inspire inspire data <coughs> data set. You know, mentioning about his papers, not that uh, speaking about situations. Okay, and so um, uh, speaking about, uh, <coughs> of course, uh, uh, Stephen, uh, Stephen, uh, Stephen Hawking and George Edis, which as you mentioned, is a, a well-respected person, but, uh, but this book is, is a very old one. It's uh, in 1973, uh, indeed, uh, there was no need to in, 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 using both dark, dark matter and dark energy. Uh, oh, okay, so almost progress appears, um, appears later. And then, indeed, the um, uh, 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 next uh, remark that Lambda CDM is actually never pretended to be fundamental for it. It will be phenomenological. But what I just said um, yesterday in my talk, of course, it, it is based on some assumptions about equations, and just the assumptions is that the gravity laws are the same, just in the spirit of uh, following the uh, uh, original ideas of Newton, that the uh, laws of uh, gravity are the same for in the... In the at the, at, the, at the Earth, in the solar system, in galaxy, and in larger scales. Indeed, Mond, Mond which uh, uh, assumes that uh, Newton's law is not correct, it can work inside at galaxy scales, but, but it does not work, it is practically excluded both in solar system, in all uh, solar uh, system tests of uh, increased gravity and uh, larger scales. Uh, so it's much more the simple idea that, um, uh, of course, it's, a, it's, an it's an assumption, and I think, indeed, uh, maybe it's the uh, uh, role of uh, philosophers to um, uh, discuss. It is a good idea, but the, uh, what's more, that the laws of gravity are indeed scale, scale independent. Uh, okay, and then uh, the final remark, uh, once more, uh, what is used, uh, as I uh, once more mentioned in my um, um, uh, operational distributions of what is that matter, uh, which is gravitational cluster, and what is that energy, uh, which is not gravitational clusters. It's simply assumption that we use 
Newton equations at sufficiently small scales but for non-elitistic velocities and Einstein gravity for larger scales. Right? And uh, the statement that dark energy, it's not, it's not actually assumed that dark energy should be exactly cosmological constant. It follows from observation that this unclassed component, its energy density is practically independent with uh, less than 10 percent other accuracy to be on redshift. So it only follows from existing observations, inside observational errors, but it is uh, uh, that we don't see it, uh, um, uh, its deviation or from an exact cosmological constant. So it's not, it's not a fundamental assumption, it's a observational evidence. So a few quick remarks. Uh, first, I suspect we are not so far apart as you've presented it in these remarks. Uh, I'll get back to that. First, the, the Balshaw paper, um, this is a uh, history and philosophy paper. Uh, the only thing that's going on, or the only use of it in this talk, in this argument, is that there were two different sub-communities going on within the steady state theory community at the time that were sufficiently different in their motivations, actions, and habits, and so on, that it's worth tracking them as separate views on the matter. Uh, so that, that was that part. Uh, second point, the Hawking analysis being written well before we had introduced Lambda and CDM. Uh, this is true. Uh, in that case, when they were writing it, I think most of my analysis would still be, I, I think I would endorse most of my analysis still, there just simply wouldn't be dark sector research, which there in fact more or less wasn't. Uh, I still think even at that point there was a mystery that is overlooked which is that we can be successful by restricting to the tools of our fundamental theory of gravity doing large-scale cosmology. And it had already by that point become clear that we could have the successes uh, that would get a program in large-scale structure going. So point taken that uh, the situation was different back then, we weren't necessarily motivated to distinguish between a phenomenological model and simply an application of general relativity because there weren't lingering discrepancies in the same compelling way that there are today. Uh, but I think the best description of it would still be in terms of two different theories, both of which happen to be written in such ways that we can directly compare across scales. Um, yeah. Okay, we are out of time, and I'm sure we can continue the conversation with Michael. So please join me.